Good evening and welcome to our webinar on good equestrian planning. Um, my name is Nicola Palmer and I am the marketing manager at the Rural Planning Co. Um, equestrian planning has proven to be a popular, popular topic for a webinar, which comes as no surprise. Um, there's a few stats here for you to ponder. The equine industry is the second largest rural employer in the UK, only topped by agriculture. And there are approximately 1 million horse owners owned by 374,000 households in the UK. So for many of us, and myself included, the dream is to have great facilities at home to keep our equine friends. Equally, if you are making a decision as to where you have your horse at livery, the facilities are undoubtedly one of the most important considerations. So we will, the aim of this webinar is to give you good advice on how to approach and make a good planning application for stables and equestrian surfaces. Um, we will hear firstly from Angela Cantrell, who will talk us through what to consider when making an equestrian planning application. Angela is a planning consultant at the Royal Planning Co. Her areas of specialism include large scale agricultural development, equestrian development, agricultural dwellings and rural business planning. Angela is our go-to person on the team when it comes to equestrian developments, as well as having great skills in helping clients visualize and implement their plans. Angela is also, and she'll be embarrassed that I say this, but is also an absolute delight to work with on any project. When making plans for a construction project such as these, there is nothing more useful than getting the viewpoint of someone who has worked in civil engineering for 22 years. Noel Gallagher from Shorefoot Equestrian specializes in drainage, structures, materials, engineering, geology, and drone 3D mapping and surveying. He will talk us through the factors to consider when embarking on your equestrian project. We will be taking audience uh, questions from the audience during the presentation. Please feel free to post these on the chat and we will either cover them off during the webinar or at the end. So without further ado, I will now pass you over to Angela who will make a start. Thank you. All right, thanks Nick, that's grand. Um, so yeah, as uh, Nicola said, I am a um, Royal Planning Consultant at the Royal Planning Company. Um, I've been doing uh, specialising in planning solutions for all sorts of equestrian facilities, from storerooms to stables, paddocks to pro arenas and uh, greenfields to gallops. Um, I've got about 20 years of experience working with private individuals and equestrian businesses um, to create some really amazing new facilities across uh, various uh, counties uh, and several, several local planning authorities. As I ride myself, uh, I completely relate to that desire to develop your own facilities to really enjoy your horses and uh, in whatever discipline you choose. In this webinar, we're focusing on just private equestrian um, developments. Um, and before we get started, I'd just like to ask you a quick question, if that's okay. Uh, just hop into the chat function, just let us know where you're dialing in from tonight. Also, just let us know what um, projects you're thinking of undertaking, uh, whether it's stables, arenas, or changes to existing buildings. Um, and if there are any, any, um, uh, any questions that pop up, I'll try and address them. Otherwise, Nicola will do that as we, as we go through. Um, tonight, we're just going to run through a few aspects um, which is important to consider when uh, thinking about taking your project forward. So, uh, it's, uh, we're just going to have a quick planning lesson. Don't worry, it won't take long. Uh, when it comes to planning, there are certain terms that it's useful for you to be aware of. These aren't planning definitions, but just help to distinguish for the purposes of understanding the planning terminology. Uh, planning regime typically covers three things. Um, operational development, so the building of something attached to your land, the change of use of land and buildings, and also permitted development where certain development is permitted by planning law and doesn't necessarily need planning consent from the council. However, it often requires a notification 
to the council to inform them that you intend to use your permitted development rights and permitted development rights in this instance um, exist for the use of a building or land for a period of 28 days or less in a calendar year. So in this webinar we'll just focus on what exactly needs planning permission and when thinking about this we'll be considering what needs full planning permission and what just uh, what constitutes a change of use. I'll run, run through a few uh, examples of typical equestrian developments such as stables, horse walkers, field shelters um, and also changes of use for instance grass paddocks, cross-country courses and the like and discuss main considerations when thinking about making a start on your project. So uh, the, we're just going to cover off a few uh, examples of operational development i.e when you build something. It's likely generally that you'll need planning consent for any of these and the best course of action is to assume that you need permission um, and just check in advance of doing any works before steaming ahead and then potentially regretting it later on when a problem arises or the council turn up on your doorstep. So we're just going to rattle through um, the different types. So um, in terms of build stables, uh, whether they're constructed on site, placed on concrete pads, um, it, you almost certainly require planning permission. And generally, councils are relatively supportive of uh, modest, uh, a modest couple of stables for personal use, subject to the usual planning considerations. There are a number, um, so, this, so th this is an example, uh, this, this picture here is an example of where a landowner assumed that because the stables didn't have a floor and was relatively mobile, um, that it was temporary and therefore didn't need permission. In this case, um, the council required the owner to apply for retrospective retrospective planning consent to formalise the siting of the shelter and stables on the land and we helped the applicant with that. As you can see from the photo there is a yard area in front of the, the stables and water is connected and there's also a fence adjoining the stables so it looks more permanent and temporary which indicates a degree of permanence and this is relevant when the council consider if a structure needs planning permission. One thing um, that the council will consider is the need for stables and how many acres uh, you have, uh, how many horses you have over those acres and what you need the stables for and how many horses you need stables for. So it's just worthwhile considering all of that and including that information in your planning application. When we're talking about horse walkers, you know, they're considered uh, permanent. Um, they are usually connected to um, concrete bases, connected to electric electricity, um, and yes, will require usually require um, permission. Um, these very smart horse walkers pictured here are ones we um, helped an applicant get permission for a couple of years ago. Um, of course, the council will consider the need for these facilities, and as such, uh, will consider the, the use and the scale of them, as well as the necessity for um, facilities such as this. In terms of mobile field, field shelters, they are a grey area in planning terms. Uh, if they're not attached to the ground and uh, removed from the land for a period of time per calendar year, they may not need permission. However, it's our experience that in most cases field shelters are erected, popped in the field uh, and never moved again. And therefore, the general rule is that even if field shelters are movable but don't get moved, they can become permanent by the passing of time. A question we often get asked is, do, uh, do I still need planning permission if I move a field shelter around paddocks on my land? Uh, and it's a really good question. Um, e even if the shelter is moved uh, regularly, uh, then um, depending on the situation, the council are likely really to consider that land to be within the same planning unit, the same holding, and therefore likely to, to exceed the 28 days for a permitted development use. So in our experience, you would nearly always need permission regardless of how often you move that field shelter. Uh, uh, so, um, and, and obviously that's sort of dependent on various designations. Um, and um, another question we often get asked is, uh, do I need planning permission to graze horses on the farm or on my land? If you're purely grazing horses, um, Without, the, without field shelters, without using part of the field for um, 
address, you know, for dressage, um, not citing anything, any structures, then typically you don't need planning permission. So when we're thinking about services, um, anything that you um, create in terms of uh, managers, arenas or um, lunch pens, for instance, um, you dig out the ground, put the drainage in and resurface. This is operational development which requires planning, planning permission. An outdoor low-key menage or lunch pen, for instance, is normally accepted for most councils. If you're likely to have a high level of usage or require uh, flood lighting, for instance, then you may have to provide additional justification and evidence. Um, but the development won't adversely affect the area or neighbouring residents, for instance. Uh, new indoor arena facilities will require justification for the scale of the structure and the use of it via a full planning application. So siting is so important in many ways. Um, it's the simple thing, it's like being able to maintain the extremities of the, the exterior of the menage um, and to cut, cut hedges and mow grass, for instance. And also, um, siting is an important where you consider um, how much cut and fill um, is going to be necessary. And this is where a topographical survey might be needed to assess, not, well, not only assess the amount of earth to be moved, but also the location of trees and hedges and services, for instance, Hedgerows and trees are a particular consideration when it comes to siting and should be probably one of the main priorities. If the development is likely to impact on the root protection zone of a tree or a hedgerow, then the council could refuse your application. We recommend submitting an ecology survey with the planning application if trees and hedges are likely to be um, impacted. When we um, turn into lighting, if you're proposing flood lighting, um, then we'd again recommend an ecology survey to accompany the planning application. So the survey would um, need to demonstrate that lighting won't uh, impact on protected species like bats, for instance. Lighting is one, usually one of the most more contentious um, aspects for a council where they weigh up the impact on biodiversity against the benefits of the proposal. And the council uh, are likely um, to apply a more stringent test where lighting is proposed on a site um, which is particularly sensitive or within the green belt, for instance. So as mentioned, lunch pens are, are permanent, um, generally uh, uh, assessed as permanent. The, the one on the left here is obviously built a uh, built form um, and would, would need planning consent for that to be cited. Um, the, the mesh uh, lunch pen on the right, although uh, is relatively temporary in nature, it's not probably likely to be moved, um, if it's not likely to be moved um, very often or be removed from the land, by, by definition it becomes permanent um, and will require um, planning permission. So generally when we're talking about the change of use, so we have an existing agricultural building for instance, as this one um, was pictured here, generally a change of use from um, agriculture um, to something else for up to 28 days a year, um, it, it, you have the ability to, to do that um, without making a, a planning application and utilise your permitted development rights. However, anything that occurs over um, 28 days a year will generally require planning permission. So to use a building, a staples for instance, you'd need permission for a change of use and if there are any external works relating um, to repositioning doors, windows, um, then it, it's advisable, uh, these will need permission and it's advisable to include these within the planning application. Um, any internal works um, are, is not development, so you wouldn't necessarily need a planning consent for that, for, for those works. Uh, when we're talking about um, the change of use of land, uh, a question we often get asked is, do I need planning to, to the planning permission to exercise horses on the farm? And if you're planning to use a certain area of your land to ride on regularly, um, then you may need a change of use for, for um, to equestrian use or mixed use if it's still partially agricultural. Um, and this um, includes facilities like cross-country courses, show jumping arenas, dressage on grass, even dressage markers, um, just in the field, gallops, um, various you know, agricultural um, sort of equestrian shows, 
farm rides and pony club events. It is all cumulative, so all of these occasions add up and can uh, add up over, to over the 28 day, days a year and therefore would likely need a change of use, uh, a full, full application for a change of use. So uh, some parts of the country are covered by a designation called Greenbelt. The plan, this plan shows um, the Greenbelt area between Oxford and uh, to Luton and over to Bishop Storford, and it's pretty extensive. Um, you know, lots of the countryside are uh, covered in this designation. In terms, in planning terms, Green, Greenbelt is important, is considered really important. Therefore, the council give a really high uh, level of weighting to whether they consider um, an, a, a proposal appropriate in the Greenbelt. And in the Greenbelt, Additional consideration is usually given to the type of materials, design, siting and scale. Often a low-key menage for private use in the Greenbelt can be acceptable and this is assessed by the council on a site-by-site -site basis and will consider the usual planning considerations which we'll, we'll come on to in a, in a moment. If proposals include additional built forms such as stables or stores, this will come under additional scrutiny um, and early strategic advice is, is recommended. Generally speaking, the Greenbelt is, is policy to prevent change of use of land or the building of anything other than a few exempted items. It's important just to bear in mind that there could be other routes to achieving your aims within the Greenbelt. Occasionally, you can demonstrate what's called very special circumstances to overcome the Greenbelt no position. Um, it's recommended that if you have a site located in Greenbelt, always seek professional um, planning advice before you approach the council. There are other des designations which can come into play uh, when uh, preparing a planning application and thinking about siting, for instance. So this um, plan shows um, a designation called uh, an AOMB, an Area of Outstanding Natural Beauty. Um, you can see here, this is the Chilterns AOMB here in red. These designations uh, can make planning harder, but in my experience, shouldn't make an equestrian proposal completely prohibitive like Greenbelt can be. Consideration of the following aspects are really important when thinking about making a robust application. So, for instance, design, uh, you'd think of how, how it was constructed um, under, um, with regard to materials. Would the council consider stark, bright timber um, stables as being un unacceptable? In terms of scale, just how large the, the, um, the development is and the use of that um, and the need for that scale proposed. And in terms of siting, so how well it sits in the landscape, um, if it's on top of the hill, then additional justification might be needed um, for siting in that location. In my experience, a low key proposals which address all of these matters should be acceptable in principle. To determine whether, um, if you are located in the Greenbelt designation or in any other designations, for instance, AOMBs, um, then you can use the uh, Magic Maps tool. Um, the link is at the top of this slide. We'd recommend taking advice early as some of these designations mean that you may have additional surveys to undertake to overcome some of these aspects and inevitably this means there's a cost implication. So a few other planning considerations um, and other challenges we come across. Um, if your site doesn't have good enough access to the highway then your de development is unlikely to be successful you could have an amazing project, uh, but if it can't be accessed safely, then it's unlikely to gain approval and support from the local authority. Don't forget that you may be able to put in alternative accesses. Um, this is where some strategic advice might come in before you um, invite the council to, to visit or submit your planning application. Uh, in terms of flooding, councils apply rigorous tests. Uh, if a site is within flooding two or three um, flood maps, Showing flood zones can be um, found at the web link um, on the slide. Even if you're aware that a site hasn't flooded in the past, the council is still likely to rely on the, um, the published flood maps 
um, to make their decision. Uh, it's, it's challenging to get them changed, but not always impossible. In terms of amenity, uh, the uh, residential amenity particularly, the impact on, on, of floodlights on neighbours, for instance, um, is in, an important consideration. And one example where we've overcome concerns with the council in this regard is where we've asked an installer to provide or, uh, or a specialist light, lighting provider to provide specific lighting details and working alongside the ecologist, we were able to demonstrate that the council, to the council that the light spill wasn't going to impact on others or protected species, for instance, like bats. We often provide uh, landscaping schemes to overcome any concerns in respect to visual impact or landscape impact on particularly sensitive sites. Um, just quickly turning to council timescales, um, these are currently quite protracted. The local planning authorities have an eight, eight week target deadline to decide applications. However, in our experience, it's a lot longer than this. I've had some applications um, for, um, I actually submitted an application for a large menage, a uh, horse walker, a, lun a lunge pit or a lunge pen, and um, a change of use of an agricultural building to stables, which should have been relatively straightforward. And this took over six months for a council to make a decision. Uh, some councils um, are better than others. So if planning a project, project I would urge you to um, prepare and submit an application well ahead of time. If you can overcome uh, all, all of these um, aspects and, and demonstrate how your application deals with these points, then, a lo uh, then as a general rule of thumb, local authorities uh, are supportive of applications that provide facilities for um, people to enjoy outdoor recreational uh, activities and facilities. Uh, we suggest submitting the pl a planning statement with the application and this just gives information about the proposal, how it's going to be used, how it's going to look, uh, where it's going to be cited and how it meets planning policy, providing additional detail on each of these planning matters. It's worthwhile getting it right from the outset and setting out a really positive case for the development. It's likely to save a lot of time, effort and money in the long run. I just wanted to leave you with a, a few takeaways, if that's okay. Um, planning is almost likely, um, you know, always to be needed. A, a modest menage of stables for private use should be acceptable, albeit it is likely to be scrutinised more acutely by the council if uh, the site is within the green belt or or has a, a, another um, designation. Greenbelt sets a particularly high, high bar. Do you plan ahead and look at strategic options you want um, to achieve what you want? Particularly if your site has certain limitations, this might involve uh, taking um, professional planning advice from the start just to get your ducks in a row. Um, just before invite, inviting the council out to visit um, because they are likely to make a site visit when they receive your application. Sounds an obvious one, but do, do your homework. Do consider siting in terms of planning considerations and practical construction. At the same time, they're often in, interdependent um, and can um, impact on the cost of a, a project massively. Um, even for straightforward projects, it can take uh, around you know, a couple of years from inception to completion. Do get advice from the experts and utilise their expertise and uh, just to bottom out some of these unknowns when thinking about applying for planning and just reducing the risk of planning being refused or merely overrunning on budget and time. Um, I think that's about it from me, but I hope you found it useful um, and and thank you. Um, I don't know if there are any questions, Nicola. Thanks, thanks, Angela. Yeah. So in answer to your question, there's a, a spread of people across the country. So we've got one in Herefordshire, a couple in Wales, um, a small livery in Leicestershire, um, a, uh, somebody looking for a grass uh, free track and arena in Hertfordshire. Um, We've got somebody in West Sussex who needs to get a change of use for her farm from agricultural to equestrian and then to build an, out, an outdoor arena um, just from being involved on previous webinars. There are 
things to consider when you want to change from agricultural to equestrian, aren't there, that um, she probably needs to consider and take into account? Yeah, I, I'd say that there are um, vari various um, issues we need to consider, and it really depends on whether it's a, a private low sort of low key um, development or something slightly larger. Um, but but yes, all the sort of considerations in respect of you know highways, any increase in in use. Um, it certainly um, on, on a couple of developments recently has become apparent that. Um, highways, um, a highways assessment is often required if there's an increased amount of use on uh, for equestrian use as opposed to um, the agricultural use, you know, tracks and trailers coming and going as opposed to, um, you know, horse boxes and horse trailers coming and going. So yeah, it's definitely one of one consideration, but it's it's um, it's very site specific, I'd say, um, and also you know just dependent on the scale. Okay, okay. So we have a question um, about the uh, curtilage of the house. So the question is, if I'm building stables within a garden, within the curtilage of the house, is this permitted development planning? Um, it depends. <laughs> it's always the case. Okay. Um, it depends on whether there are any designations on the house. Um, it also um, it depends whether there are any um, any permitted development rights which have been removed um, from that property. Um, generally, um, there are occasions when you can erect stables within your within your curtilage if it's associated with um, within your you, you know your, your domestic use of that of that curtilage. Um, but it's definitely on a case by case basis, and we I'd be happy to to look at that in more detail. Brilliant, thank you. Um, another one, if you bought a property that had an agricultural tie and already had stables built and an arena, but was sold to you with the property, how does this work? Um, it depends a little bit on history, I think. Um, if uh, it depends if it's a tr it very very much depends i think the, the the critical thing to look at initially is the wording of that agricultural tie whether mm -hmm. it's a, a generic tie whether it's specific to that um to a rural work in living there and farming the land what what it actually says so i think that's the first port of call um and um we've just done we've done, just done a similar application recently where we've be been successful in removing a tie um, and then uh, going forward to uh, developing their, their equestrian enterprise from, from, that, um, from that property. Um, and that was all sort of off the back of um, various sort of technical planning, boring technical planning stuff, but um, it, was, it, was, it was really useful to, to get to grips with exactly what was going on on site and the history and um, the, the original planning consent um, and, the, and the description of the planning consent and also any conditions attached to that. So that's a really useful thing to, to have to hand um, if, if you want to take that further and for, have further advice on that. Okay, thank you. Um, you talked about uh, mo a modest development so i think you mentioned you know a couple of stables and a horse walker or, or whatever it was is there a definition for a modest the modest development or how, how does it work no definition unfortunately um if it was that black and white my job would be very easy um, <laughs> um but um it, it very it just depends on your sort of gut feeling i think from the site um it really is site specific. It's um, it very much down to how the local authority approach these applications. It's um, it's just really the scale. So in terms of obviously clearly scale, you know how how big can can you go for for private use? Um, and I think that um, you know I've done applications for private use for up to ten horses. So. You, you know that it, it is you know i say uh, modest applications in in particularly sensitive areas maybe um but but slightly uh, you know other areas say for instance outside of the green belt um then it is possible to achieve slightly um increased scale um of these developments even though they're private use 
Okay, thank you. In addition to Greenbelt and AONB, is there also a designation as countryside, which I've been told previously by a planning officer is higher than Greenbelt? That's interesting. Um, <laughs> that's a really good. Uh, it doesn't sound <laughs> like um, to me the countryside is is open countryside. So that's anything outside a development boundary. So a development boundary being very tight around town or city. Open countryside is is exactly that, um, uh, excluding greenbelt. So it's it's not what's included in greenbelt. Um, open countryside isn't. A, it isn't a designation. There might be other designations that perhaps they refer to. I don't know whether it's parks and gardens or whether it's, um, you know, designated open space or, you know, there, there could be numerous other designations that that, that planning officer could be referring to. Um, but it, on the face of it, that doesn't sound quite right. Um, so I'd perhaps be challenging that. Yeah, and just looking yeah. at that a bit more closely. Yeah. OK, so we've got a couple of other questions there. I think what we'll do now is we'll move on to Noel and then we'll come back and answer those afterwards, if that's if that's OK with you. So let's um, move over to Noel. Thank you, Angela. That's brilliant. Good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, absolute pleasure to be invited to talk to you all this evening. Uh, my name is Noel Gallagher. I'm very sorry to anyone who's disappointed um, to see uh, another Mancunian. Um, unfortunately, I was named after my father, who, because his family was Irish and he was born at Christmas, he's called Noel as well. Um, so I'm civil engineer for Shawfoot sure Equestrian. Um, the major, um, the, the thrust of our uh, business is is equestrian surfaces and constructions as well. This also spills into other agricultural buildings um you know industrial as you know all sorts you know um roads and all kinds um so obviously tonight we're talking about the considerations when you're going to site um your arena to begin with we're going to cover the really simple stuff um so obviously got the site and location considerations uh, then we've got the budget um you know this is this is a long path that everybody's undertaking um you know you need to have an idea of, of, of what it's going to cost you know i mean even a self-build is still it's 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 a it's a big investment there's a lot of materials go in there's a lot of time and you need to do it right because you need it to last you know you're going to spend the money and you've got to get the, your money's worth out of it then we're going to briefly talk about time scales just give an idea on what you should expect an equestrian build to take obviously varies massively and finally the equestrian surface options so they include um, what we offer and then other people in the industry not everybody offers the same a lot of people offer the same but call them different things um, so uh, site and location considerations um, I'm splitting them up into practical uh, technical which is more my area so practical is more your common sense the technical is sort of my area where, where we look at doing like the topographical surveys, looking at the British Geological Survey data, borehole data, soakage tests, um, to make sure that you know your build is going to be you know long lasting, sustainable, and all the rest of it. And finally, a tiny bit on ecological um, considerations. Not going big into ecology. I'm not an ecologist, but if you just give a little bit of thought. At this stage, um, and as has been, you know, as spoke about already, you can just save a bit of a hurdle right at the very end of your planning application. Um, so practical considerations, um, we need to utilise the space efficiently. So by that, I mean eliminate wasted ground. Very few fields are completely square with a 90 degree hedge line. We like our arenas to be nice and square, 90 degree corners. Um, so if you've got you know if you're going to cut off wasted ground we want to try and minimize that as much as possible sometimes it might mean bringing it to the middle of a field so you can split smaller paddocks and what have you um we're going to need access for plant machinery materials obviously we've got to get in to build it so you know these are a big construction now we can make access we can we can we can put gateways in hedges we can move gate posts you know we can take down walls and rebuild them to a certain extent um so everything is possible but that is something you know you might have easier access through another way 
access to a neighbor's fields you know sometimes you might be able to you know if you're friendly with the neighbor or sometimes go around to the next farmer and bottle of whiskey you know helps um access for grazing mowing hedges so obviously this is referring again to the if you've got land that's you know been sort of landlocked and um, you need to get in there to tend to it you don't want to get in overgrown because before you know it you'll end up with invasives you'll end up with like mare's tail ragworts stuff like that um good access from your yard and stables um so you want it to be close enough to your yard and stables obviously not too far away you might need to put a road or track in that adds extra cost uh, or you'll end up with a muddy track through your field then at the same time you don't want it too close because you know i'm sure many many of you when you've been on livery yards you'll be riding around and you'll have a horse kicking off in the stables whinnying and what have you and then it upsets the horses being exercised or vice versa someone's tearing around the, the arena and all the horses in the stables are going mad um trees another consideration not from an ecological point of view but purely for the fact you need to keep as much organic matter as possible off your surface most of you know, your surface is, is is inorganic so it's a mixture of sand um, or you know rubber synthetic fibers and what have you the more organic you get that in, in it it breaks down becomes a soil then it becomes a fertile uh, pasture for for plants to grow eventually it can block up your drainage over many years so you need to think about trees as well from a planning consideration obviously keeping out of the root zone some of you next near to roads fairly self-explanatory nine to five between nine and three monday to friday the road you live near might be nice and quiet and then to quote a recent client up in derbyshire he said on sunday the road by them is like brands hatch so we pulled that away back away from the road a bit we had a soil bank built and what have you so you don't want obviously horses spooking and you might have a neighbor nearby so we just try and keep it away to keep it keep everybody happy basically next consideration how easy is it to get utilities water and electric supplies to the build very few people think of this uh, i get sent drawings this is i'm gonna have my arena here i'm gonna have my stables here okay brilliant how are you going to fill your buckets how are you, in, in six weeks time it's it's going to be pretty much dark at this time um how are you going to you know it's how are you going to muck out when you go home from work so you're going to need lights so when we design and when we plan a build we think about we try and future proof things so we'll put ducts in so we'll put an extra duct in say for a comms cable so that you could have cctv even wi-fi because you're better off having it in there it doesn't cost much to do but then it's better than coming back and having to rip everything up and try and put it in again uh, lastly does the position uh, and installed infrastructure allow for further development of the site again this is about future proofing you know if this is the start of your development it might be quite modest or whatever at, at the minute down the line hopefully things will expand and things will grow things will evolve so you'll want to you, know, you can build a 40 by 20 arena we build them in such a way that you know in five years time or something you could say right let's stick 20 meters on it let's make it a 60 by 20 full-size dressage you know you, your kids who are on gym counter ponies at the moment when they get to teenagers and they're show jumping well let's make it into a 40 by 30 so that we can you know fit more jumps in we can have doubles along the bottom end um, and stables as well and slabs um, technical considerations this is my sort of area um, these will need surveying investigative work and uh, searches to evaluate uh, old-fashioned methods of surveying myself well, fashion traditional methods of surveying obviously um, taking levels we do that with a dumpy level um let's see have light uh, total station um, we also have we don't go anywhere without our trusty tape measures you know cans of spray <laughs> however something that um i use more and more only got it briefly but we use this we use drones an awful lot um 
we practically for ev every job now. So we take hundreds of photos. We then process this. We create maps that we can take measurements off. Um, and we create 3D models that we can use in the design process. Uh, and it just helps us topographical so we can see the levels for the site much more accurately and much faster than if we were using you know, the traditional methods, which we still use for validation as well, by the way. Um, primary concern for me is what to do with the water. Most arenas have land drains installed, but not all of them do. And I'll get onto that shortly. So our usual solutions uh, are ditches, brooks and rivers. These are my preferred because if you can find a ditch, you can find that normally the water is going to get away. It's not going to cause you an issue. Obviously brooks, rivers, um, and you've usually got suitable height over it. They were put in there to drain the land. You're not draining anything more that was ever there before. So they're more than adequate, they're perfectly fine. Sometimes might need a little bit of dredging, but usually not a problem. The other option is soakaways, attenuation ponds and reservoirs. Uh, these also work. However, there are some caveats and yeah, um, it's all to do with water management and how as a country um, we manage we manage our water. Um, the last reservoir to be built in this country was Carsington Water in Derbyshire, and that was in 1991. Since then, we've sold 35 of our reservoirs, and 10 of them were in service at the time. So when people tell you now that we're having droughts in the summer and then we're having floods in the winter, a great deal of this is purely down to water management. The um, also as a country, we use very little groundwater compared to 40 or 50 years ago. I'll give you an example. So this is what this graphic is in front of us here. This uh, is the um, groundwater. It's a borehole under Trafalgar Square in London. So the groundwater, we used to pump lots of groundwater for big industry. So if you look to the left-hand side of the graph, it's like the 1900 turn, the start of the 20th century, you can see the groundwater was dropping. That's because we were extracting more and more, obviously between 1910 and 1920, around there, we've got the First World War, big industry coming into London, steelworks and everything, really, really using more and more water through the Second World War. Then we had an erratic period through the 50s, 60s, Industry then started to move out of London in the 70s. We used far less water. Then as we get uh, towards 2000, we're getting really high, um, you know, sort of just 30, 40 degrees below, uh, below, below, below the surface. In the 1980s, it was rising by three meters a year and started to cause real concern for the London Underground. This is managed now. However, as a rule over the country, groundwater is higher than ever. So soakaways work in many situations. They don't work, work in all. So we have to do soakage tests. Sometimes you can dig a hole, you can get down 500 mil, half a meter, not even two foot, and it will start to fill the water. So that's how high the, the groundwater is. We don't pump the aquifers on the Pennines as much as we used to anymore. So we get an awful lot of runoff coming down the mountains. Uh, something you know, the thing people ask, is it climate change? Short answer is no. So this is a graph that I've compiled using data I've got from the Met Office's Hadley Centre. It goes from 1873 to 2022. So practically 250 years of rain data. So have a look, we've got a scatter diagram and then I've put a trend line on it. Uh, if you look at the scale on the left hand side, incidentally, the heaviest or the most rain was in 1887. We haven't had a year like it since. Or I, don't, I don't think we will this year. Um, the trend line, yes, it is going up slightly, but it's going up something like 75 mil over 250 years. So it's gone from 1,000 milliliters of rain to 1,075 milliliters of rain over a year. We've also got better measuring techniques, better reporting. So it's, it's the, the, 
the jury is out on that one. It certainly isn't catastrophic flooding. You know, we've got more concrete, we've got more tarmac, we need to manage the water. We should do it. So we do that through um, sustainable drainage. Uh, the next technical consideration for me is the type of ground. Um, stability, we get this data from the British Geographical Survey. Uh, the borehole data is absolutely fantastic. They went around, I mean, it's, it's still going now, but it's been going back a couple hundred years and you wouldn't believe how close you would be to, 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 an, to an old borehole and very, very um, comprehensive data of the, the rock below the surface. Um, it's, it's absolutely fantastic. Key for me is I need to know if you've got sand, if you've, if you've got clay, but if you've got peat, you know, or running sand, um, that's, you know, you, you, could, you could put an arena in, it'd be absolutely fine. You could have a layer of clay, but under that clay, like up in, in Diggle, um, on the side of the, of the moors, up in Lancashire, we, we would do, when I was doing a job for the Canal and River Trust, we dug down and there was clay. So we were working on the clay and as the machine was tracking back and forth, it was sinking and sinking. And then we realized, we found out that under this clay, there was peat and it was so it was basically a, a swamp as a marsh. Um, so, so there's the, you know, it's, it's another thing that, that, that we think about. Um, the drainage properties of the ground, you know, if you're really lucky, if you're down on the very Southeast of Kent, you know, towards Dover, Folkestone, or the White Cliffs of Dover, you can, you know, I, I surveyed a job down there and it was raining so hard, but the field wasn't wet. A little bit muddy, but not, you, if it was in Cheshire, you'd be up to your knees. It would have been an awful, um, you know, because on, and as soon as you start digging underneath, you've got chalk. So the water just soaks straight through. It's lovely. Same with some parts of North Wales where you've got a lot of sand underneath um, going up towards the Northwest, Lancashire, Fylde, the Fylde coast, parts of Preston, um, going you know, f you know further north, southwest as well, Devon and Cornwall, you know, lots of sand. Then when you're getting towards the Midlands, where the potteries, especially, you've got clay and hard clay, and that doesn't necessarily drain very well. But as a result, we have lots of drainage ditches, so everything is possible. Uh, soil type, nice couple of. I, I like these um, two graphics. Um, so you know, there's six sort of main soil types you've got clay soil type sandy soil silt soil peaty soil chalky soil and loamy soil loamy soil is a sort of mixture of all of them ideally you want a nice loamy soil or you know or, or sandy soil when i go and survey jobs up and down the country i get told that oh we're on clay it never drains it's so wet in the winter and it's so hard in the summer and when you do a bit of investigation, you find out that it's it's not because it's got clay underneath. You know, we, one of them was was um, one of them was over in, in, in Norfolk, and, and I looked and I thought, there's actually sand in this soil, and a lot of that is down to the fact that equestrian properties and equestrian or small holdings, you can't rotate the land the same as a farmer would. So you're constantly, you know, grazing. You might be able to rest a field for hay, but that never gets ploughed in and then done for spuds for the following year. So that just ends up. Horses are notoriously hard on, on ground because they've got flat hooves. They constantly mash it. Then you've got all the organic. No matter how hard you poo pick, all of that organic creates smaller particles. So when we dug down on this particular job I'm referring to, if you were to take a cross section, the top inch maybe, was so so solid wouldn't let any water through it and underneath was lovely sand so it's really good draining ground so th again things like that that, that 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 we look at and to build an idea to make sure that we don't get any unforeseen circumstances anything that's going to come and bite us later on uh, so other technical uh, considerations ground levels uh, Nicola touched on this earlier on. Um, sorry, Angela. The um, you might not think you've got much of a slope in your field. We like to keep arenas nice and level. We can do them on a slope. Prefer not to because your surface can migrate over the over time. So we want to get everything nice and level. If you've got 
I think, how did it work? 500 mil. So if you've got 500 mil of fall over 40 meters, which if you were to look at it, isn't a great deal at all. It's half a meter, barely two foot. In terms of cut and fill, you would have to move 200 cubic meters of material, which is about 300 tons. So you're talking 15, maybe 16 wagon loads of material to be moved from one end to the other. Cut and fill basically just describes literally cutting the material out of one section and then filling to build up the other end. The graphic on the right hand side is generated from uh, one of the drone models. Uh, it shows the outline of the proposed arena. Now we actually went for a different, the pictures are elsewhere in the presentation, went for a different layout towards the road, towards up here was where it ended up. So the area here in red, that's areas that need to be cut and the, and the areas down here needed to be filled. Now this was set to just, just purely for cut to try and reduce it down to the yard because the yard is a good bit lower than this area. Uh, so yeah, is there much of a slope? Risk of flooding. The other issue with with this, where the, where the arena was, there is a floodplain running down here. And when we went to go and visit it in the summer, it was nice and dry. You went back, you know, there's some some rushes, some bull reeds down the bottom. When you back in, when you went back a couple of months later, it was absolutely saturated. It was like walking through a bog. Um, so yeah, risk of flood, risk of flooding. Does the area sit within a floodplain? And are there any nearby rivers liable to flooding? Again, this data is available uh, the, the, for planning purposes. The government have, have that link, which was shown earlier. The Environment Agency in England, they have it. Scotland have very similar through the government website. Wales, Natural Resources Wales, they have very comprehensive flood data. I think, the, I know Natural Resources Wales was, I think the EA also has interactive maps so you can see where the floodplain is and, and, and where it isn't and last one on, on this one is are we nearby live services and utilities we're talking power cables water pipes gas mains telecoms um, I can, i've just got a print out here i've not got, this is so this is a safe digs drawing which shows um shows the outline it shows an electric going across there's a job that we're due to start in a couple of weeks time um, so we need to be aware because we don't want to be digging down and striking something for, for, for obvious reasons. For obvious reasons, sometimes it can prohibit you putting the arena where you want it. If a service is in at a certain height, the cost to get it diverted is absolutely prohibitive. Only the likes of supermarkets doing it to put an entrance across a, a dual carriageway or something like that. It's it costs absolute fortunes. So we try and obviously work around all that. Luckily. With being agricultural, this hope this shouldn't be an issue. Uh, ecological uh, concerns, very very brief. Um, these are some of I mean I like the owls you know, and, the, and the trees are nice and and I often wonder do they bath badgers before they take these lovely pictures pictures because I've never seen one looking that clean. Um, these are protected species. Uh, keep away from badger sets to the point where when I was working with the, um, working with the Canal and River Trust, we were dredging a section of a feeder channel which goes from a reservoir to a canal and there was a log crossing. We weren't allowed to move that log and put it back because it had evidence of scratches on it and that was a track that a badger was using. So we do need to keep away Newts, our little friendly newt at the bottom. Newt populations are still struggling. Um, so our ways to manage them, if we can just approach these and look at it, like as has been said earlier, with your ecological survey, means that it's not going to trip you up right at the very end when somebody all of a sudden throws it, throws a spanner into the works. Trees, from an ecological point of view, we, I mean, for me personally, try and be sympathetic to trees. I try and avoid taking down ash if I can, because we've got ash dieback uh, across Northern Europe and obviously oaks. And while we try and keep out, out of the root zone, we can, you know, you, you, you could, you can build over roots. This is, this is a bit of a frustrating thing. Local authorities, depending where they are, just won't seem to let you touch it with a barge pole for some reason. 
Uh, yes, yeah, so preservation and conservation, and again, are the natural habitats nearby. Uh, what I haven't mentioned so far is bats. This especially applies to if you're having lighting. Um, it's, it's, yeah, it, bats are doing very well. The, the populations are on the rise. Doesn't mean to say that we should start building unsympathetically, but it's, 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 it, 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 it's it's a it's, it's a really tricky one, um, and that's why you need to have your you know have your back count done and all the rest of it, um, and then tree protection orders. There should be very few in place that you wouldn't already know about. Uh, so more all, all important is budget. This is the bit we all hate talking talking about, but we have to be very realistic. You are about to embark on what is a big investment. There's no getting away for it. Even if even if you're building it yourself, and people like me will give you as much info and advice as you need to build it, because hopefully you might buy a surface off us, or you know, or get us into do to do something. So we 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 we've got to be realistic. So an arena is a large project using hundreds of tons of material. The majority of work on materials you will never see. It's sadly it is not just a bit of sand and a bit of fencing. The drainage under the arena, the membranes, which is plastics related to the price of oil, they've shot up in the last couple of years. Uh, they, they're, they're expensive. Um, the outflow to the ditch or soak away, whatever you have, and your drainage bed. Your drainage bed contains up to 50% more, sometimes more material than your surface. And that's underground. You're never gonna see it again, hopefully. Like I say, even a self-build will cost significantly. Uh, so uh, what affects these costs? Just to give you an idea, because we'll send a price out and I'll itemize it as best I can. We always give a full detailed specification so everyone knows what they're getting. And they look at it and they go, oh, that, well, that wasn't a you know, sharp intake of breath and all the rest of it. Um, the specification of your build. So what is actually going in there? You know, what are you... What are you being sold, basically? I'll give you an example. So I try and do a minimum drainage bed of 150 mil of, of, of clean stone. If somebody you know, specified 100 mil, well, that's, 50, you know, the 150 is 50% more, which means it's going to hold 50% more water. It's going to be firm. It's going to perform better. But that also means it's going to cost more. Location of the site. Uh, this is geographically mainly aggregate prices vary massively over the country, all over the country. Your distance to the quarries matters much more now. Haulage, that is, yeah, it's, it, it's, it's an absolute pain. Um, the quarries feel it when I talk to reps and, and I'm on one of you all the time. It's, it's, it, it, it's difficult. It's, 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 like, it's like everything now that, that involves fuel. Going back to geographically, we try and use clean limestone towards the South Midlands and you know, west of Kent and what have you. There's a lot of granite. There's not much limestone, so it's granite. Granite is a more expensive material. It's more energy intensive to quarry because it's a harder material. It's, it's denser, so it's slightly heavier per cubic meter, so you get less for it. That puts the price up. So yeah, so the location of the, of, of the site, uh, access to the site affects it a little bit. If you've got a tight alleyway, you know, or tight access can at the time. And then planning conditions. This is very important. We've, um, the job we're working on in Wales and the planning stipulated certain drainage scheme that that had prices from other installers and other contractors who've gone, yeah, we're just fine. We're just going to put a soakway over there and everything. And then when I looked on the planning conditions, no, we can't actually do that. We've it's got to go into two separate soakways. It's got to go away from the house this way, and that added extra cost. What I would say is when you get your planning application accepted through, once you've finished cheering and whooping and you're relieved and it's all done and, and you know and the Royal Planning Company have done a fantastic job, um, 
this is where you need to read through your conditions because they'll grant you planning, but it will always have conditions. Um, so you just need to check. One that I had to bring up recently on a plan application I've seen is put an application that there was an existing access in off the road, but they wanted to put a stone track. The council stipulated that the five meters from the carriageway to the gate had to be a bound surface, which wasn't clear to the client. That basically means you've got a tarmac it. So that means you've got to ideally put a curb along the road, you've got a tarmac it, you need edgings either side, you need somebody who's street work certified to do the carriageway bit. All of a sudden, you've added 12 grand plus the VAT to your project, and that's just through one condition that, that, that you're planning to have uh, that your council has um has put through um if you are getting quotes off people this is me being impartial this is me speaking to customers and to other people i know a lot of people within the industry who you know we, we install together we often help each other out we often work together we often we supply material to a lot of other installers so what to be wary of when you're getting a price. So somebody who gives you a definite price or specification over the phone without a site or visit, without, without a site visit, sorry. This happens more than you might think. It, it's, I've talked to two clients in the last 12 months that this happened to, um, I said in the last two years rather, you know. Um, they can't, they haven't seen the sites, so they can't tell you, you know, they can't evaluate the levels. They can't see if it's going to drain properly. That means they have a set specification. One example was a build down in Dover, a couple of miles back from the White Cliffs of Dover. You dug down, it was chalk. That field was never going to flood in a million years. The company in question was specifying full drainage you know with an outflow to, to to a ditch and all this no but this is how we build them all over the country it didn't need it because the water would just go straight down into the ground so you're going to be paying for things that you don't need or even worse you'll get to halfway through and they'll come looking at you because they have there's, there's more it's going to take more materials or something and that is a situation you do not want to get in and also as as a builder we certainly don't it's it's you want to make sure that we know what we're doing from the start we're going to do it and we're going to do it well um, a lack of detail or ambiguity in the quotation if you get a quotation that says 40 40 by 20 arena fenced with such such surface brilliant but what's going under it what's you know how much on this and everything so when when i personally when i do my quotations you get a really thorough detailed you know we've been up against there's one, one quite recently i'm not going to name where where we were being played off and the, the other contractors yes they were cheaper but they had absolutely no detail so so what's going in there is 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 recycled material going in there which a lot of the time recycled is very good but you need angular if it's rounded it will move under the surface that can cause issues if there's a lot of brick like a high percentage of brick Bricks are made from clay, which has been baked in an oven. If you soak bricks for long enough in water, they eventually turn back to clay, which means they could become squidgy or start to block up your drains after, after a few years. Uh, site visit on a Saturday and a price by the Sunday night. You might get somebody who's really keen, come out and see a Saturday morning. Yeah, this looks brilliant. We can do this. Yeah, I'll get a price to you as soon as I can. Sunday night, you sat down in front of the telly, you open up your emails. Oh, brilliant, I've got a price off them. That's, that's, look at that for service. They won't have been able to ask any quarries for any price of materials. If they're, you know, three, four pound out per ton, they're going to start losing money on, the, on that part of the job. That means they've got to make that money back in other areas on your job and that it's not going to end well. It's, it is going to end in tears. There's first. <laughs> unfortunately probably yours and finally a lack of investigation most jobs that i go and survey i end up getting a shovel out and just having a having a little dig and that's just on the first survey that's when i'm only providing you know an indicative quote before we say right this is going to need a little bit of investigation soakage tests and what have you if they come down you know, sit the finger up the wind and that kind of thing yeah that's fine pace it out and all the rest of it 
are you sure that they've they've done the searches that need to be done? You know, we're, we're, we're talking about a, a big investment. We're talking about something comparable to, you know, a, a small extension on a house. So if a brickie's coming out to survey that, he's, he's going he's gonna to give it a good dose of looking at. Um, it was missed off there, sorry. The budgets, um, very, very rough ballpark figure. And this is from, to get it installed now, Biggest costs are your material costs. Um, so a high quality and a guarantee as well. This is the thing. So guaranteed 40 by 20 installation should be in the region of 30 to 45,000 plus the VAT, depending where you are in the country. That's fenced with a gate, with a surface, all made good around. Um, that's the sort of region where you should be looking. I'm sensing some sharp intakes of breath naturally so self-build you won't be far behind in terms of you know by the time you do the materials getting somebody to do it and the worst part is if you have to get somebody to do it twice because then you're just hemorrhaging money on that one so that is budget next time scales just to give you a brief idea outline of how long a typical arena build would take Again, massive variation, but just to give you an idea, so you've got something in your head, um, you know, now the seven, you know, obviously the complexity of the project, access to the work area. If we're coming across a field, if we haven't got, sometimes we're blessed with being able to go straight off a yard or straight off a hard standing. That is absolutely brilliant. We can build them 365 days a year. If we've got to go in through a field that hasn't got a track, we're very, very dependent on the weather because the more mess we make, the more we've got to put right. And it has to be put right. That's, that's how it's got to be. Time of year weather. Um, as a guide, a build will be two to six weeks weather, to, weather permitting. In the summertime for 20 40, we aim for two to three weeks. In the wintertime, you're looking four, five, six weeks. Um, do not be surprised if your contractor needs to pull off for a couple of weeks due to poor weather conditions. They aren't leaving you high and dry. You've likely got lots of materials on site anyway. They want to get it finished because they want to get the final payment in. So don't worry, these things happen. It's, it's as you can see from the picture there, we struggled through that. We managed to get it drained. It was absolutely, it was like a swamp. It was awful. We, we started off, it was brilliant, it was frosty. Then it defrosted, the rain started. Incidentally, this last year, we've been able to do more installations during the winter months than we have during the summer months. It's topsy-turvy topsy this year. Uh, so moving on to uh, a question, surface options. There is a lot of subjectivity around this area. There's a lot of marketing terminology there's a lot of branding you know and, 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 and rightly so each manufacturer um, you know everyone produces decent 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 products so starting uh, we've got sand on its own wood chip which uh, isn't very you know sand on its own wood chip not used very often rubber chippings and then we've got recycled synthetic fibers essentially um, carpet fibers so we've got eco fiber or premium stabilizing fiber mentioning automotive fiber and automotive rubber i've mentioned them here i've not given a full page um plenty of suppliers still supply them they are very aesthetically pleasing not my cup of tea because they don't offer much to the surface very good for a top dressing the rub automotive rubber can stain um horses feathers and what have you so i'll just leave them where they are next we have waxed fiber and then finally the pre-mixed semi-synthetic surfaces uh, sand on its own or silica very rarely used on its own it's prone to riding deep and it dries out quickly um, sand is is a bit of a not an issue, but people get wrapped up in this term silica sand. I mean, all sand is silica sand because the majority of it is silica dioxide. That's the term silica sand means a sand that is essentially 
over 98% purity of, of quartz, basically. Um, and you very rarely find that. So every advertiser, everybody advertises silica sand, but you very rarely find that. Um, I mean, look in the pictures there. I've got I've got three different sands. Um, each of them are the same grading in terms of granule size, and that is what is key. You know, we want to no. make sure it's a washed sand that no, we I'm have. Sorry. I'm sorry to interrupt, but we just need to skip on a little bit because it's now yep. coming up to quarter past eight. So we just, um, oh, if we could just skip please. through the last few slides, that'd be brilliant. Thank you. Yeah, that's that's fine. Yeah. So wood chip again. We don't don't use it. Right, recycled rubber chippings. We mix these with the sand. Um, we've got recycled car or truck tire, recycled agricultural tire, and at the bottom we've got our premium rubber, which is recycled rubber play surfaces or pitches. So astro turf. Um, shock bed and then we've got the recycled synthetic fibers and we've got eco fiber and then automotive fiber and rubber and then the waxed fiber and the pre-mixed semi-synthetic surfaces um, the fiber can be used as a standalone surface it's very good mixed with sand it um, like I say um, it resists uh, riding deep, so you ride on top of the surface rather than riding deep in it. Reduces the chance of injuries from that, like we used to get with sand, you know, like 20, 20 years ago. And finally, it retains moisture and it also resists freezing. And I'll gloss over the final one, which is the the waxed fibre and premix surfaces, which aren't really relevant for these are ultra premium surfaces. Personally, for for domestic use, I wouldn't recommend. You, they're not value for money. They don't give the benefit that the cost should give. So they're, they're for real commercial commercial uses. So yeah, thank you very much. And apologies for uh, for, for getting into it. That's no problem. Thank you very much. Um, right, just I'm just going to try and very quickly just answer uh, ask a few more answer a few more questions um so just very quickly angela um is there an open source website where we can find what the current planning status is of a location um we are at a location where horses have been grazed for decades but i'm not sure if formal planning permissions change use from agriculture to a question was ever sought um so the best place really to access that information for a particular site um, if you want to know about a particular site, it's probably to um, approach the, the council as to the, the planning status. So we can often do um, online re searches of, um, under the planning section on the, the local council. Um, there isn't really a national. There isn't really a, a sort of national database of, of of that that you can access easily. Um, it's about doing research with the local council really to establish what what the history is um yeah that that's i think about i think i hope i've answered the question um okay. i mean we can always answer these questions afterwards as well it's not a yeah. problem I'll go back to people individually um just one sort of a both of you does proximity to a public footpath have any bearing on siting of, of an arena from a construction and planning standpoint not as far as i'm aware we have had to put a gate in an arena to maintain the footpath that crosses the arena so i think that can be pretty much accepted from my experience yeah and um we've had experience where we've installed a, um done a plan application for a, for a gallop aware similar situation where um a footpath crossed the, the gallop um we just installed safety gates basically um in terms of sighting um, I suppose ideally the, the council will always, nearly almost, always condition um, where there is a footpath impacted that that, that footpath remains open um, and that will probably be conditioning the, the, the means of facilitating that, so i.e. a gate either end of the menage or whatever that whatever that looks like. Um, I think ideally they, they'd rather, from a safety point of view, that it wasn't cited um, uh, over a footpath, um, but it's that's not that's not insurmountable. Um, you know, it can be it can be addressed as we as we just discussed. 
Okay. Does the historic presence of an agricultural building aid the planning process? Um, depends what you want <laughs> to, to use it for. So, if you, for example, if you were wanted to change the the use of that building to um, to stables, um, you, you, I suppose there's an element of it's already a structure, it's already there, so um, there isn't the fear of the the unknown. I.e., what, what is it going to look like? What is what is it going to be used for? You know, I suppose it's if it's got an established use, then if you're changing the use, then you just demonstrate how the change of use is betterment ultimately um so so i suppose that in, in answer to the question is you know if the structure is already there um then at least you've established the structure it's it's merely just a change of use at that point so okay. then taking into account highways and um use of, of that of that site for that for that purpose Thank you. Okay, there's a few more questions. What we will do after the webinar is um, tomorrow, Angela and I will go through them and we will forward any that are relevant to Noel and he, I'm sure, will be delighted to answer those. So we will come back to you individually. So please don't worry if we haven't managed to get to your question. Um, just a little bit about us. So the Rural Planning Co is a team of highly skilled and experienced planning consultants. We have experts across many, many areas, um, all with a rural slant, um, with over 160 years of combined planning knowledge. Um, we are undoubtedly, as a team, passionate about development and growth in the rural sector. Much of the, um, of the people in the Rural Planning Co are Harper Adams graduates, and we really are all very passionate about the rural sector. Um, we specialize, specialize in agriculture, equestrian, rural business, and residential. And as, um, from this webinar, if you are interested in having a, um, a, using our site appraisal services, our site appraisal level one is normally £300 plus VAT. And um, if you wanted us to offer, um, to give you a site appraisal, then use the code WBE23, and we will offer that to you for half price at £150 plus VAT. And that will get you to the point of understanding where you're at um, with your site. Um, we will do the designation checks, we will view, review the local authority position, position um, where you are in the country and offer you a 30 minute discussion with an experienced planning consultant um, with a follow up email and recommendations. So we're delighted to offer anybody who's viewed this webinar that um, half price site appraisal. So um, we'll finish there, but as I said, we'll come back to people on, because um, we're conscious that we're 20 minutes over now, but we will come back to people with their questions um, and make sure that you are answered. If you do have any questions outside of that, we are a very friendly team. I'm sure, as I've said, Noel will be happy to answer any construction questions. Um, our telephone number's there on the screen, um, email address, please do contact us and we'll do our best to help you. So I'll say thank you very much to both of you for um, very interesting presentations. And thank you, Noel, for joining us. And um, I've refrained from making any jokes whatsoever about all this. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, and we hope you've enjoyed it. Any questions, just get in touch. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.